Hey guys, welcome back! Indiana Jones related video games were always priorities to me. I was always attracted by the unknown, exploring exotic locations. So, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was all that, packed in one single and overwhelming experience. As you've witnessed on my video related to my favorite point and click graphic adventures, this one is right at the top. So, let's explore it a bit more and dive deep into its origins and how it came to be. Let's take a look! The sequel to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusades arrived in June of 1992, and it was just what every indie fan wanted. The perfect adventure that should really be turned into a full-length feature film and even remastered for the current-gen systems like Day of the Tentacle was. I even consider it the true fourth indie's adventure and not the disaster that was the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. They just don't make him like this anymore. The game's multipath approach inspired players to replay it over and over. The international travel to these beautiful locations, the interesting characters, the music and voice acting, the well thought out puzzles, the double crossing Nazis, the mysterious artifacts, all these ingredients were very well mixed up offering a compelling story that grabbed the player right from the beginning. Let's find the airport. Screenwriter Al Barwood, that would later return to also write the script for Infernal Machine, wrote an amazing plot centered around the lost continent of Atlantis. Barwood is an old friend of George Lucas. They went to film school together and George knew all's huge interest in games back in early 80s. So Barwood started to hang around the Lucasfilm Games group for several years where he met folks like David Fox, Ron Gilbert and Noah Falstein. As you know, these three guys were the ones behind Indy's previous adventure, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. When the time came to produce a sequel, everyone was working and pursuing other projects, so the doors were completely open for Barwood and his background in script writing and interest in video games led him to winning the jackpot. Even so, Barwood ended up receiving a little hand from Noah Falstein after all, that helped him out on writing the story for Fate of Atlantis, also conceiving the idea of the three different paths, perfectly capturing the spirit of the original movie trilogy. I've forever been intrigued with Plato's amazing Atlantis dialogue, so The Last Crusade was indeed begging for a sequel that eventually arrived firstly in June of 1992 with a floppy disc original release and a year later by May of 1993 on an announced Toki CD-ROM edition which included amazing voice acting and digitized sound effects. It features over 8000 lines of spoken dialogue and in this voice was masterfully provided by actor Doug Lee. This talky version was the one that I played back then, right when I bought my first PC, my beloved IBM PS1 486DX2, running at 66 MHz, playing and replaying it over and over. Needless to say that I would, many years later, also grab the GOG and Steam versions to play again, and again, and again. Damn, I completely lost the count of how many times I've played and finished the Fate of Atlantis. It still has the power to held my attention hostage like if there was no tomorrow. That's it. That's it. It offered an overwhelming and original story that can rival the ones from all three first movies. As said, the fourth one is quite forgettable. So Nazis, a sort of mythological and supernatural flavor and a beautiful and somewhat annoying female character were the perfect ingredients for an Indiana Jones adventure. To mince with you. Sophia Abgood would return later for Indy's first 3D action adventure, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, released in 1999 that I've also reviewed in the past. Sophia Abgood. She used to tag along with Indy in many previous adventures from this fictional universe, but in the meanwhile, she decided to leave archaeology to become a psychic. In Fate of Atlantis, she possesses a valuable necklace with this powerful medallion through where, when invoked, the spirit of the Atlantean king Nurab Sal telepathically communicates. 
As the name suggests, we take control of the famous archaeologists in a frenetic race against the Nazis to be the first to unveil the secrets and whereabouts of the lost civilization of Atlantis. It's an the action takes place in 1939 when Hitler's foes are searching for an ancient Atlantean power source that will potentially supercharge their tanks and bombs. You saw that? So off we go on a globetrotting adventure which manages to capture all the action, humor and undertone of the movie franchise with John Williams in temporal soundtrack playing in the background. A variety of compositions were arranged by the iMuse team, Michael Land, Clint Bajakian and Peter McConnell, wow. and the fact of not being based on any of Indy's previous movies gave loose rein to Al Barwood and his Whoa. team to create this unique, inspiring and original story. Look at that! It was on development for around two years, and it all began in George Lucas' research library at the Skywalker Ranch. There was a book of world's unsolved mysteries from where this diagram of Atlantis popped out. It was screaming to be transformed into a video game. And so it was! Obviously that a huge amount of research was in hand, so that a convincing story would arise out of it. And that was when Barwood and Falstein learned about Orichalcum, the Atlantean semi-precious alloy, something that really plays a huge part of this new indie adventure. One of the many possible locations for the legendary lost city was in the Mediterranean Sea, more precisely in Terra or Santorini, a volcanic island in the Aegean Sea, a few miles off Crete. Between the centuries 17th and 15th BC, a massive volcanic eruption took place, which led also to a huge tsunami that ended up annihilating the Minoan civilization on Crete. The aftermath of this catastrophic event can even be seen nowadays. The fate of Atlantis is very much inspired in this particular theory with its Mediterranean setting. Speaking about the title of the game, during the development long meetings were held at the Skywalker Ranch trying to come up with a better name than Fate of Atlantis. Is there a better title than that? I doubt it! Also during that process, Dark Horse Comics created a series based on Barwood's and Falstein's story with an initial title of Indiana Jones and the Key to Atlantis and later renamed to Fate of Atlantis. It was published in 1991, a year before the game's own release, and despite being the same basic plot, there were some notable differences in the story. As told, Fate of Atlantis offers a choice of three paths – teams, fists or wits, being Sophia's company throughout, a lighter or more action movie-like experience or a solo puzzle-solving journey, respectively. Hello there. It depended on how you see the character Indiana Jones, a lover, a fighter or a true scholar and archaeologist. So different ways of approaching obstacles and puzzles will present themselves, with the in-game dialogue and storyline being cleverly adapted to each situation. Now, now, my dear, there's nothing to be afraid of. The IQ score returns from the Last Crusade, so if we're after the maximum score, we must complete each of these three paths. The paths will converge upon arrival in Atlantis, but it sure was a tremendous and arduous task to implement in-game. As I've mentioned many times before, the visual design of Fate of Atlantis is sublime, is thanks in particular to Bill Eakin and his team, who also drawn the game's cover that drank huge inspiration on Drew Struzan's amazing posters from the most iconic movies from the 80s. This outstanding pixel art is something to behold, with its many different and beautiful locations, around 120 to be more precise like this particular one in the Azores that was captured from a real location. It makes this game so epic in scale, cause they were mouse drawn right into the computer using deluxe paint. Digital scanners were kind on the expensive side, around $5000, so by the time the right deal was finally made, the game was practically finished. Only just around 10% were paintings scanned at the very end of development. Foot of Atlantis was the last pixel paint project at LucasArts for PCs and one of the largest graphic adventures ever to arrive from George Lucas' company. It was also the first fully voiced game coming from LucasArts that sold over a million copies, 
one of the company's most successful graphic adventure. Besides all that, Fate of Atlantis was also the first LucasArts game to feature rotoscoped in-game character animation. Him too. Steve Purcell, the creator of Sam and Max and the artist behind the incredible box art of Secret of Monkey Island, posed as Indy, while Skelet Michaud acted as Sophia. Funny enough, they ended up married later down the road. Just like The Last Crusade, The Fate of Atlantis had also an action game, a quite forgettable one. The graphic adventure was so good that practically no one played the action game designed by attention to detail that loosely follows the plot of its point-and-click counterpart. Besides the PC, Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis was released also for the Amiga, Mac and FM towns. The Sega CD was supposed to also have its own enhanced edition, but it was eventually cancelled due to the commercial failure of the Secret of Monkey Island on that system. Two concepts for a sequel were conceived, Indiana Jones and the Iron Phoenix and Indiana Jones and the Spear of Destiny, but both ended up cancelled due to problems during development. Even so, those were reworked and transformed into a couple of Dark Horses comic series. I'm not sure what the future holds in relation to video games based on Indiana Jones' character. As you know, Indy's last adventure was released back in 2009. Indiana Jones and the Staff of Kings, and it carries a quite sad story in relation to its development. Just when LucasArts was preparing to create the most spectacular Indiana Jones video game ever for the brand new HD consoles from Sony and Microsoft, Naughty Dog released Uncharted that was all that the new Dr. Jones game was meant to be. Everyone at LucasArts just stood petrified looking at Nathan Drake and thinking that they've completely missed the chance of making something great. The Staff of Kings was finally placed on store shelves two years after the release of Uncharted in a completely unrecognizable way. The HD versions were nowhere to be seen, these were cancelled due to obvious reasons and only the Wii, PS2, PSP and Nintendo DS versions saw the light of day. The only cool thing about this title is the inclusion of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis as an unlockable extra exclusively in the Wii version to take advantage of the real point-and-click mechanics, also offering an improved MIDI version of the soundtrack. Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis succeeds where movies based on the series have failed and it still is a playable and glorious tribute to a character that is simply my favorite in filmmaking history. What do you know, a secret door. 27 years later the Fate of Atlantis refuses to die and I truly hope that somewhere in the near future we'll receive another suitable adventure worthy of the presence of the man in the hat himself. Mr. Otis On cinemas it's already guaranteed his presence with the fifth installment in the series. As for video games and as said, I'm not sure what the future holds. Where do you think you're going? Hope you've enjoyed this episode of It's a Pixel Thing, and if you did, don't forget to like, to share, to comment, to subscribe and to click on that bell icon, so that you're notified when all my future content becomes available. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!